All right, well, it's it's uh, it's one o'clock mountain time, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm really happy to uh, welcome our first keynote speaker, Daniel Piker. Daniel is involved in the design and realization of complex forms and architecture through both research and practice. After studying architecture at the Architectural Association in London, he's worked at Arup's Advanced Geometry Unit and is currently part of the Specialist Modeling Group at Foster and Partners. He's also the developer of the software Kangaroo, which enables a wide range of interactive physical simulation, form finding and optimization within the Rhino 3D CAD software. And I just want to personally add, I, I've been a follower of Daniel's work for, for a long time. It's really he does amazing things. His, uh, his, he's posting a lot of things recently that are really interesting on his Twitter feed. I encourage you all to follow that. And, um, and he's contributed to uh, several forums and blogs that I've been following his own website. It's uh, always, always interesting to, to see what he's been thinking about. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, David. And uh, thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I have to confess, it's uh, a little intimidating talking to an audience of mathematicians. It's uh, not something I do often. I'm not a mathematician myself. Um, by training, I originally uh, did architecture, as, as Dave said. Um, and I feel I'm sometimes better at putting ideas into pictures than I am at putting them into words. But I'm going to give it a go to try and do a mix of both today. Um, but please forgive me if I make any terrible mathematical mistakes in my descriptions and correct me at the end. Um, so I want to start this journey with an experience I had. Uh, I think I was about 15 years old and I went to a sculpture exhibition uh, by the uh, Brazilian artist, Sajé Camargo. And this piece of marble, um, a still image doesn't really do it justice. So I tried to replicate uh, virtually the, uh, the sculpture as I remember it. And uh, it was the first time for me that I felt like a piece of stone had told me a joke. It was like, it's one thing and you walk around and it was like uh, the geometry was playing. It, it was humorous, it was joyful and it really made an impression on me that a piece of sculpture without being figurative, without representing anything else, purely the geometry uh, could have that sort of impact. And that's uh, something that stayed with me. Uh, another kind of key point in my journey is, was uh, as a young architecture student, I was making a lot of models out of paper, as I'm sure um, many of you do origami and these kind of things. And um, I was making these uh, modular octahedra, slotting together six squares of paper uh, from the, the, the notepad by the plane. And then uh, I started assembling these into larger forms and making this sort of uh, icosa, ico Okay, so the dodecahedron uh, surrounded by these octahedra, and I was making it and um, seeing that it didn't quite match up, but I was at first assuming that uh, uh, my model must not be accurate enough, I haven't, you know, is the, the thickness of the paper or whatever. And this was around the time when I first started using computer modeling, and uh, my tutor at the AA, the Architectural Association at the time, they introduced us to Rhino. Um, and I started trying to model the same thing as I've been doing in paper. And so, yeah, join one octahedra, two, three, four, five, and there's a gap. And, uh, and I checked, and yeah, that's, that gap is really there. That's a geometric feature. And the computer was able to reveal that to me, something that I could miss through physical modeling. And that, um, and it was one of the first things that convinced me, like, yeah, this is really something useful. It's, you can engage with it in a kind of similar way that you do with physical models, but uh, at the same time, you have copy paste and 15 digit accuracy and all these things uh, that let you discover a different type of uh, things than you might be able to purely making things by hand. Um, but illustrating mathematics, um, I was uh, one of the things that came to mind when when I first uh, 
saw the, the title of this, this event. There's a, there's a quote from Einstein that's always stayed with me. He was interviewed by uh, Hadamard, um, being asked about how mathematicians think and what, what role words and images play in their thought process. And he asked a bunch of physicists and mathematicians. And um, the thing from Einstein's answer that really struck me was, uh, he says, words don't come into it early on. Um, and this combinatorial play, um, the elements are mainly visual and muscular type. And I found that a really curious phrase. And I mean, visual, yes, okay, thinking in pictures, but muscular, I think, uh, it's not that he's uh, flexing and working out. I think it's it speaks to something about um, our sense of physics. We, we talk about grasping something, and uh, it's about physical intuition. We can use our experience of interacting with real-world objects to uh, to engage with geometry and mathematical ideas in a different way. Um, inspirations uh, along along this the way as well. Uh, so as an architecture student, there are a few books that really made an impression on me. The first two there, they're uh, more uh, geared towards architect, but really just wonderful exp um, explorations of uh, geometric ideas and uh, everything from polyhedra to minimal surfaces and um, and yeah, a few other books. I, did I see that Caroline series is here in the event? So if so, thank you. It's a wonderful book. Um, and uh, the tiling and patterns uh, to Grunbaum and Shepard when I worked at uh, Arup, uh, the advanced geometry unit, that was, we called it our Bible because it was uh, something we referred to so often. So these, these um, great examples to aspire to in terms of visual communication of mathematics in my view. Um, and as time went on in, um, in my architecture studies, I became very interested in this idea of form finding. And in architecture, um, there are a few pioneers. Uh, Gaudi uh, was one early uh, user of form finding, and particularly um, Fry Otto, using ideas like uh, the hanging chain models, where you can take something hanging under gravity, invert it, and get a form which works as a compression structure. And I love this idea that you can kind of use physics uh, to teach you how best to resist physical forces and find these forms in that way. Um, so hanging, hanging chain curves. If we want to model a catenary, one way we could do it is to roll a parabola, trace its focus, and the curve we get then is exactly our catenary. Line things up. Um, or if we are interested in bending of uh, wires or thin strips of metal, uh, we could look at elastic curves. And again, there are there's, uh, geometric constructions. I learned about this one from the, there's a great thesis by Raf Levian who wrote about splines and uh, their applications to fonts. But this here, if you, you roll along a hyperbola and trace, trace the vertex, then you get exactly the elastic curve. So great fun, but uh, if we want to actually design with it, we need something obviously much more general purpose. Um, so we might want to also do the kind of form finding like for we did with soap film to find minimal surfaces that we could then use as tensile structures. And that was what led me to develop Kangaroo, which is a, a form finding tool embedded in the CAD application. So of course there were form finding tools long before this, there was, um, but they were mainly used by engineers and they were things where you'd have to set up your inputs, wait for it to calculate and then adjust. And I really wanted to bring in something uh, a bit like what I saw in game engines, um, where you could have a really rapid dynamic feedback and um, use that to inform your design process. So this is the, the application I've built. I know some of you are starting to learn it, these or grasshopper and rhino these days. Um, and it, it lets you 
plug together in this visual programming environment of Grasshopper many different types of goals, I call them, which are essentially energies to be optimized for. And people started using it and they've been making uh, initially lots of pavilions, little experimental structures as uh, compression only things, um, some early tensile structures. Um, as time went on, I would try and add more different things for it to be able to optimize for, in this case, uh, bending and looking at different, uh, different energy formulations that I could incorporate in this case. There's this nice simple model um, from Sigrid Adrianson and Mike Barnes for the Elastica. And great, it lines up, it matches physical experiments. Uh, and we use this for some things like uh, grid shells, which are these structures which you can assemble them. So they start out flat as a completely regular grid. You push them up, for which you need uh, by forcing in the sides. Um, and you need to be able to know what shape it's going to form, hence the, the computation, and then fix the diagonals to hold the shape as a structure uh, or inflatable structures, jumping a huge order of magnitude and scale. But a few years later, I'm working at uh, Foster Partners and uh, trying to apply some of these same principles to much larger buildings. Um, or even in completely different domains, I, it, sort of extended, it started out very much as simulating physical form finding, and then grew to uh, incorporate more kinds of geometrical constraints. So in this case, it was about making a structure out of identical radius cylindrical rods and optimizing so that that distance between the center lines of the rods was the same so that it would be touching. Um, or another very recent application of it, I just saw the other day, um, Tensegrity structures are a great example of where you might need to use form finding because uh, where it has most application is areas where the geometry and the forces have to be intimately tied together. So like you could cut a piece of steel into an arbitrary shape and within certain limits it's going to stay that shape. But uh, if you design a fabric structure, it needs to be negatively gaussian curve. And uh, if you design a uh, integrity structure, you need to do it in a way that the forces will be balanced. And that's where the, the form finding process comes in. The technique it uses is something called dynamic relaxation, uh, first described in 1965 by Alistair Day. And um, the basic idea is very simple. It's just taking a load of out of balance forces, tracing the displacements, um, with a, a pseudo -dy dynamic approach with a bit of damping, and eventually you converge uh, to a situation where those energies are minimized. And originally it was talked about for use uh, in static analysis, but over time it's been shown that you can use it for a huge range of things. And uh, somewhat of a mentor in this has been uh, Christopher Williams from the University of Bath. Um, and he's particularly famous and known for his application of it to the British Museum Great Court Roof. And if you see here on the left was the, the initial grid or mesh that they started from. After many iterations, they arrived at this particular triangulation and then through relaxation, um, finding a smooth transition between the rectangular and the circular boundaries. One thing I've always loved about this, this project, which I think is people don't always notice is how nicely the, uh, the top of the portico on the right lines up with the triangulation. So it's not just, uh, not just the simplest triangulation you might think of when you connect a triangle, connect a rectangle and a circle, but there's, there's an element of design in there and um, it's been chosen so that there's a, an aesthetically pleasing balance. Um, in terms of applications at uh, in my work at Foster's, more recent stuff. This is a cross rail terminal. And again, it was a similar thing in this case, a much more reduced uh, set of constraints where we had uh, triangular panels which had to stay within limits for what was possible with the ETFE pillows and the, the beams. But uh, the, the middle section of the building is completely regular and repeated, but the angle of that end beam is, uh, 
is inclined quite a bit more than the rest of the grid. And hopefully it all looks uh, quite smooth and you don't see it, see a jump or a difference. And that's that's because it's been um, relaxed to to optimize for the these changes in angle and uh, while well, keeping within the, the lens limits. Um, for more uh, fabrication oriented things started using it for, like in this case, um, trying to make planar panels. So a common thing in architecture is we have a, a roof or a facade and we we need to discretize it somehow. And if it's going to be glass, then curved glass is a lot more expensive than flat glass. But uh, you can't make flat quad panels unless they meet certain geometric constraints. So we've been trying to develop tools that make it easier to design within those constraints. Uh, an example of that in action fairly recently. So that's a rapid overview of what Kangaroo is and what it does, but I'm going to talk now a bit more about two particular um, geometric topics that uh, I found really fun to explore and um, that give some examples of the kind of role that um, visualization and illustration play in my process. Um, so this is a fairly common requirement in say product design where you might want to distribute a set of uh, perforations in a speaker, for example. Um, and you might start out with a, a regular regular arrangement. Um, but it turns out to be a surprisingly um, complex and rich problem, even uh, if you want to have all of the circles the same size, if you've got even just a circular boundary, if you have a set number of circles, how do you fit the largest possible circles within that boundary? And I, I found it quite shocking that something so from such simple conditions, then the best known solutions are actually often quite asymmetrical and surprising. Um, so other approaches to circle packing, common one, um, You'll see, and I say circle packing, and I realize that mathematicians often use that in a much uh, more specific sense. Designers tend to say circle packing for all sorts of distributions of circles. Um, so in this case, uh, you might start by randomly placing some and then placing another one, checking if it's inside an existing circle, um, rejecting if it, if, if, if it is, um, sizing it uh, sequentially, that kind of thing. But uh, Say I was interested in um, fitting equal size circles uh, in boundaries or on surfaces. Um, so here, starting to use kangaroo in this case for uh, the geometric constraint that no two points are closer together than a certain distance. So it, it uh, checks the distance between all the points and you have to do a bit of uh, sorting and optimization in the, the code so if you don't want that to be too slow. Um, and then you can push them apart and you can get pretty nice distributions where the circles are all touching some of their neighbors. Um, but uh, those of you familiar with circle packing will know that uh, there's some, some not so nice features in here. There's a lot of gaps which are not three-sided, um, which are unavoidable if, uh, if you're sticking to circles of exactly the same size. Um, and actually, the, so the, I mentioned dynamic relaxation, but the specific form of dynamic relaxation used in Kangaroo 2, the current version, it's, uh, it's actually very similar to an approach uh, given in this wonderfully titled paper, Divide and Concur. Um, and the basic uh, idea here, and it was actually I only discovered this paper much later. I learned of a similar technique through other routes, but I think this is one of the earliest examples of it. Um, but the basic idea is essentially these alternating projections. You satisfy one set of goals um, and you satisfy another set of goals independently, and then you recombine them into ge geometrically coherent uh, results and repeat that and uh, keep repeating that and you'll converge to to the intersection of your goals if, if it exists. Um, and the, so actually on the left here, you see um, sequential projections, uh, which was actually quite popular in game physics uh, 
maybe 10 years ago. And it, it's good, it converges very quickly, but for the kind of things I was interested in, I wanted to also explore goals which maybe conflicted where there was no overlap. And I wanted to, it to find a balanced solution, which the, the average projections does, whereas the sequential one, you'll always keep jumping back and forth between two conflicting goals. So, and circle packing is, I just keep getting within my software, I keep getting people asking for new, new versions of circle packing. I'm amazed by how many different questions there can be on fixed radii, fixed families of radii, different boundaries, tangent to the boundaries, points uh, in the boundary or on the boundary. Uh, even some fun physical experiments. This is the Brazil nut effect. So, so if you, your box of muesli um, gets shaken around in the truck, then uh, people have noticed that all the Brazils tend to rise to the top. Uh, so we can simulate that even from very simple granular physics. Um, that's forward a bit, and it, indeed you end up with the big ones at the top, not just through, um, not just because of they're lighter, but because of um, the size of the circles. But if we want real circle packings, um, I say real in the sense of uh, compact circle packings where the gaps between them are three-sided. There's, um, well, there's some obviously um, the great work of Ken Stevenson, but the, I learned of this approach through this paper um, from uh, Alma Putnam's group, which, and they, they came up with a very nice simple geometrical condition on the, the four lengths uh, of two adjacent triangles. So if, if they, you have two triangles that share an edge and you, the sum of pairs of opposite angles has to be equal, and that guarantees that the, the in-circles of those triangles uh, will be tangent at a common point on the line. Um, so if you optimize for that, then you can do things like generating these structures where the beams, because they, so the normals of the circles you can use as the nodes of the beams. So each of these yellow rectangles uh, doesn't have any twist. So you can make it out of flat sheets because uh, the, the normals of the circles uh, are coplanar because they're touching at the same point on the common edge. And this can also give you proper circle patterns, proper compact circle patterns if you take circles through these points of tangency. Uh, and applying this to, to three-dimensional models, on, on a curved surface, they won't be, um, unless it's a sphere, they won't be perfectly tangent because it's actually tangent spheres, but if it's a smooth enough surface and your circles are relatively small, then you can get pretty close. Um, you can also apply things like periodic constraints in kangaroo. Um, so this is an example of taking different triangulations and finding what's actually a unique circle packing. So given a triangulation, there is one and only one pattern of these tangent circles. Um, and that's something that I, I keep coming back to this idea of um, finding the, and, and in using an energy to minimize um, and get to a unique representative of um, some topological form. So you might, um, so you want to get the, um, you, you might start from some arbitrary geometry like this ugly triangulation in the lower right, and you can use optimization to find um, a better representation of that. So um, another, another question I got asked about uh, circle packings or point distributions was uh, someone asked me how to model a golf ball. And my initial thoughts uh, seemed, yeah, quite simple. I'm sure it's like a geodesic dome, take an octahedron, subdivide it, uh, project it, you know, I thought that was, it was going to be fairly simple. Um, but the more I looked into it, the, the more confused I got because I, I was checking the, the dimple counts on some of the, uh, the popular designs for golf balls. And I couldn't find any level of subdivision uh, with an octahedron, no matter how you, um, even with a twist, you, there was no way to get that number of, uh, of dimples. And it's, it's quite hard to see in um, just from visual inspection. But actually, quite a lot of golf balls use 
not icosahedral, but tetrahedral symmetry. Um, so here's an example, again, with a, a symmetry constraint. So we're doing collisions, but also uh, colliding them with their neighbors across the symmetry constraint um, for cubic geometry or for a tetrahedral geometry. And uh, yeah, this the symmetry gets quite disguised by the time you, you, you reach the end result. Uh, so that's actually the arrangement on uh, on one of the more popular golf balls. Um, next time you have a golf ball in your hand, see if you can spot the uh, the four the four corners of the tetrahedron. Um, and yeah, I, I couldn't resist taking one of these and trying to optimize it for for proper compact circle packing. I noticed that uh, in the literature, the uh, their examples seem quite far off being compact. So I wonder if there's any improvement possible there with uh, applying a bit, a bit more mathematics to that. Um, so that, that covers like given a thick, you can either start from lots of points and distribute them through collision um, and get a distribution that way, or you can start from a, a given mesh and optimize that for circle tangency. But what if you want both, you want adaptive numbers of circles and you also want uh, circle tangency. And that's where remeshing comes in. And that's something I'll come back to a little bit later when I talk about surfaces. Um, but here is an example of how you can um, take a surface and uh, through a series of small topological optimizations, alternating, alternating between the topology optimization optimization and the geometry optimization, you can get in a way the best of both. So adaptive numbers of points and also, well in this case, equal radii, but uh, from the beginning um, and these circles. So this is um, the kind of applications I have in mind for this. Uh, sometimes in jewelry, they do these pave designs where they want to cover curved surfaces or complex within complex boundaries have huge numbers of uh, tiny gems closely spaced. Uh, other people found applications of it to more pavilions. Um, different type of circle packing here. This is a, a beautiful paper uh, by uh, Stefan Seppelman and others. Um, and they describe an energy which I was able to also implement in Kangaroo, which like the tangent in circles energy, this gives you for triangles. This is they gave a set of angle conditions which allows tangent in circles between adjacent quads, and also well, not all quads have an in circle, so it guarantees they have in circles, and also that a tangent where they have a common edge. And uh, so you can then optimize for this in Kangaroo and um, use this to to explore these types of meshes. Um, and um, there's actually some really nice links between these meshes and uh, discrete minimal surfaces. So actually, if you take, um, if you enforce this condition about the tangent in circles of quads, and also that the edges are tangent to a sphere, you can do this uh, duality operation where you um, uh, swap the directions of the diagonals, and you can switch. Um, and if that if it's on a sphere, then you get a discrete minimal surface. Or for any of these surfaces, like you can take any discrete isothermic surface and switch it into a different one. Um, Mobius transformations is something I keep coming back to, and I will talk a bit more about it a bit later on. Um, these. So that here, just seeing a bit more clearly the remeshing, um, how um, that you, if you fix the points along the boundary, then you've actually, as I mentioned before, you've got a unique circle packing for that topology. Um, but here, it's allowing it to change by adapting the topologies as you drag it. It's flipping some of the edges. Um, Many, many more applications of circle packing. I'm not going to go too long into other other variations of this because I want to get on to well a little bit on conformal mapping. Um, so you can 
given a packing of circles in an arbitrary boundary and a packing of circles with the same topology in um, another boundary, you can generate a conformal map between those two. Um, and I have another book which uh, made a big impact on me is this, uh, this one by Tristan Needham. Um, I don't, um, if you don't know it, it's, it's really a wonderful book. Um, I had a strange encounter with it. I was a, an architecture student. I didn't, I mean, I'd studied some mathematics in school, but I'd started to get interested in some, some geometrical ideas and I hadn't quite figured out how I was going to be able to model them. And I was browsing through the bookshop happened to pass through the mathematics section. And this book, like I knew it was all way above my head, all the mathematics in it, but there was just something about it the, that spoke to me. The, and it, it, it's, it's, it takes a, a really visual approach to explaining all these ideas. And there's a nice bit in the preface of the book where he says uh, he compares the state of mathematics as he sees it to a society where you can only uh, read sheet music and you can talk about music and you can analyze music but you can never actually perform it and to him that's that's and the way it is with with geometry sometimes um, and he certainly makes great use of it in the book so yeah it's, it's something I keep coming back to and um, I just love the, the possibilities with combining sources and sinks and streamlines and and that, so the, the project that it actually came from was this, uh, what I called reatomic surfaces. So I was, I'd been making these physical models of uh, helicoids, but I had a, found a way of folding paper into these helicoids and then so that you could join them together and into larger surfaces. And I was trying to find a way to do that in a smooth way. And that was what some of the ideas in the complex analysis book um, eventually led to this um, this way of generating surfaces that, uh, well, if, if you take horizontal sections through these surfaces, then you get the, um, the equipotentials of your, your sources and sinks. Um, so the main um, focus now that I, I want to, to go into is um, spanning surfaces of knots and links. Um, and it, approaching it from a few different angles. And um, I think it is, it's a rich topic and it has a lot of mathematical and software history. Um, three pieces of software, particularly um, now fairly old, old software, but uh, very influential. And I've, I've tried to, in a way, take elements of these, these tools and combine them into one coherent thing um, so that you can actually use these features together. So um, Surface Evolver, Ken Brack, is um, had great impact in the field of minimal surfaces, knot plots um, for relaxing knots, and then CEPA view for uh, finding CEPA surfaces of knots and links. And then a few artists that inspired me. Uh, Bathsheba Graceman was one of the early pioneers of 3D printed sculpture. Uh, making a lot of mathematical ideas in Rhino. Some really beautiful work. This one is perhaps might, is a little bit out of place in that um, to Eva Hilt, from my understanding, she doesn't actually work through equations or computers, but it's actually all modeled um, very much by hand and intuitively, which I find fascinating that, I mean, they many of her pieces look very close to minimal surfaces. Some of them look like constant and curvature surfaces. And I think it's, it just shows that our, our physical intuitions about geometry can be quite powerful. And it, it makes sense to try and use that. Um, another just beautiful piece, uh, more of these uh, minimal or close to minimal surfaces. And of course, uh, Carlos Equin, um, who's uh, been a big figure, not just in creating sculptures, but also writing about them and about the software and the techniques used to generate them. Um, but this, so I think quite a key moment from my understanding of uh, the way that uh, the mathematics of minimal surfaces developed is the cost of minimal surfaces, it, the, the computer played a very interesting role in uh, how actually 
verified that it was embedded. Um, and I think it, it, it's quite nice that they they describe how they actually um, were able to, from this very early days, I think early 80s, if not before, to, to actually use the computer to, to check things and get some get some feedback that wasn't always obvious just through through looking at the equations. So I've been trying for many years to model minimal surfaces or close to minimal surfaces on various knots and links. Uh, initially, a lot of it, I was starting with uh, manually modeled quadrilateral meshes. So here I would have started from, from uh, uh, a simple base mesh and subdivided it and then relax that. But that can be quite challenging actually designing that quad mesh becomes quite a challenge in itself. So that led me to uh, techniques for triangulated surfaces. Um, but there, if you want to relax uh, triangles and you treat the edges just as springs, then the density of your triangulation ends up having a huge effect on the result that you get if you can distort the form. So this um, in uh, in uh, geometry processing and graphics, there's very widely used Cotan Laplacian, which it solves this problem. Um, so you can actually uh, relax per triangle, and you can even simplify it further. So the bottom right, you can actually just uh, relax each triangle um, by pulling the points towards the opposite edge with a force proportional to the length of the edge. And that can give you proper minimal surfaces up to a point. So you still, so you can start from a good mesh and you can relax it and get something like the cat mode in the middle and that's great. But then say you want to change the boundary. Um, then at some point your triangles, even with the cotan weighting, you still get too distorted to actually get a nice result when you relax it. So that's where the remeshing comes back in. Um, so it's this idea that given a triangulated mesh, you want to keep the triangles as nice as possible in various, and what, what you count as as nice as possible can be various different things. Um, in this case, if you want to, uh, to collapse an edge, so if you have an edge which is too long, then you might want to split it into two triangles. Um, if you want to um, want to split it, want to if you have an edge which is too short, you might want to collapse it and remove those triangles. Um, and you can do these things iteratively um, and alternating with the relaxation. Um, is there are many many papers written on on this this topic, but these are a couple of the ones that I found particularly useful, and I think some of the earlier ones. Um, and what that gives you, you can start from some horrible mesh like on the left, so you can, and that's from doing various solid geometry operations in CAD, you often end up with these quite ugly meshes, but then you can repeatedly apply these, these remeshing steps and end up with, with triangles which are actually very close to equilateral and mostly valence six meshes. Um, in the last recent years, I've, so that's, this is something I've developed more for right now, I've actually um, added a feature into Rhino for these um, high quality triangular meshes. Um, and a lot of the work there has gone particularly into feature preservation. So how do you remesh to get even triangles and also keep track of sharp features has been particularly challenging, but seems to be working now. Um, so put all that together and you have meshes which can behave like soap films, you can have large changes in the boundary conditions, large changes in the geometry. And uh, because you're not using just the edges as springs, you're using the actual triangles, you can get good minimal surfaces and you can, you can have quite dramatic changes in, in the way the boundaries interact. So you can even change whether they intersect or uh, you know, make, make topological changes to your surfaces.
Um, you can also add pressure into the mix. So this is um, minimal surfaces with a volume constraint. So yeah, turning on volume and uh, and sculpting with it, we can uh, start to to come up with forms with constant mean curvature. Um, and for me, a lot of these, so these, I don't often distinguish between illustration and exploration. For me, it's often the same thing. I, I need to make make geometrical models often to understand ideas. And it's it's a way for me of um, figuring things out. And then hopefully sometimes turning those into tools useful for other people or useful for explaining things. But, but the prime, primarily, I'm often just trying to understand an idea better myself by making pictures of it. But it's, um, this is uh, replicating some of the, the experiments by Fry Otto, who I mentioned at the start of taking a soap film with a, a thread floating into it and uh, using this to design uh, uh, fabric membrane shapes. Um, experimenting more with that, I was just through the process of playing with it, I was quite surprised when I started. I tried to model certain classical minimal surfaces and uh, didn't always get the results I expected because it it's um, but I learned that actually this this is this makes sense. Some of these things, although they are minimal surfaces, they're not necessarily uh, stable in in the initial configuration without other symmetry constraints applied. Um, so then coming back to applying these to knots and links, you can take take a, a knot curve. In this case, pulling it so it's now an unknot, but keeping the surface attached to it. And we can make these big uh, changes to the geometry while keeping our mesh attached and minimal. Um, so knots, if we want to, to find, uh, from, a, from a given topology, we want to start from all these different knots and get to the same thing, then this is somewhere where relaxation can come in useful. Um, and one way that I've been doing that is essentially you take an interaction between, you discretize it and you take all the points of the knot and have them, in this case, repel all of the other points. In fact, usually much higher density subdivision than this. Um, and then when you apply this, you can, you can then start relaxing these knots um, to find, um, and it, it's, it's quite pleasing, I find sometimes to, start from something very sketchily drawn and then end up reveal some symmetry that you weren't aware was there just from the initial uh, plane and not drawing. Um, but yeah, trying to often make these into intuitive tools, um, things that people can interact with. And in all of Tanger, a lot of it is about um, aiding the development of intuition. And I think play is a really essential part of that. Um, so doing things and seeing the results quickly lets you get a feel for how things behave and uh, I think can help with how you think about them. So putting that together, so the knot repulsion and the minimal surfaces together with the remeshing here, starting from what is actually a trefoil knot, relaxing and remeshing and we can, can very quickly jump to something like this. Um, I talked briefly about conformal mapping before and complex analysis. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple of other, what I think, great examples of um, of illustrating mathematics that uh, that have really inspired me. Some of these quite old, but I think still uh, hold up brilliantly. In this case, uh, Talking about the links between uh, obvious transformations and uh, stereographic projection. Um, one one uh, website in particular was uh, Thomas Banshop's work. Um, he has this wonderful page on the flat torus in the three sphere, and I, that really got me fascinated with um, what the three sphere was and trying to get to grips with that. Um, it's another great example. I won't go into too much detail about these, but just um, pointing to them. It's wonderful examples. And of course, um, Schwarzschleimer and Henry Segerman's work, they've done some wonderful 
many great examples and illustrations of stereographic projection and vibrations of knots, which is something I want to get onto next. Um, so ideas of inversion, stereographic projection. Um, one of the first bits of code I wrote for Rhino was a tool to invert arbitrary meshes. And I felt what, what I wanted to, to explore, I've seen a lot of examples of um, mathematical transformations like inversion or bottom mesh rotation, but I struggled to grasp them because they, they were with unfamiliar objects. So as it was in Rhino, and we can have um, 3D models from all sorts of great sources, is um, I felt like if you can put recognizable objects through these transformations, then it becomes a little bit more intuitive. Like, while not everyone's going to recognize an inverted tetrahedron, they'll recognize an inverted room. Um, and I, I think yeah, the, these conformal, conformal transformations of room space, I just find not just great fun to play with, but I think um, it, it's, it's one of those things that's just, it feels like it's just on the, the border of what's possible to get physical intuition for. And obviously there's huge areas of mathematics which are, don't have any obvious geometrical realization. And then there's, there's three-dimensional geometry where there's a direct um, realization. But, um, with uh, curved 3D spaces, it feels like it's on that fascinating um, cusp between the two where you can, and the computer can really help with starting to get a feel for some of those things. So great example of um, uh, a minimal surface sculpture, minimal surface in the three sphere, this I'm sure you all know, sculpture of voice surface. Um, I got interested in trying to, to model something similar, starting from, so this is the, the minimal surface with three planar ends that it begins as, and I was um, playing and trying to develop an intuition for it through this um, stereographic projection and 4D rotation. And this is the form of it, which you see in the sculpture, um, but if you turn it a bit further, go all the way around, I felt like this is the interesting bit. This is the, uh, the part of the surface where, where it all happens. Like, okay, it goes off to infinity instead of closing up. This is the, the triple point is what you really want to see. Um, so I uh, was able to turn this into, into a surface. And so a lot of the time I'm trying to take geometrical objects and make them easier to grasp, often very complex forms. Um, uh, Complex, not necessarily complicated, like difficult to grasp, but consisting of few elements and trying to uh, present them in a way which makes it a bit easier to, to get a feel for them, to sort of have it as something you can turn around in your head. I think self-intersections often, often conceal that and make it very hard to, to grasp what the surface is really doing. And um, another great inspiration here, of course, is uh, George Francis, who, this book is full of amazing hand-drawn illustrations um, and lots of great ways of explaining topological concepts. Uh, he was also a pioneer in um, computer graphics as well. So um, later on, he also made some, some wonderful uh, renderings of these types of surfaces. Um, and particularly the other ones I want, um, I really like are uh, these minimal surfaces um, uh, described by Blaine Lawson, in this case, the Klein bubble. Um, but again, the self-intersection makes it quite hard to follow. So I, I, I took that and I tried to, to cut it in a way where you could see it in the same way that, uh, that I did for the, the real projected plane. But I'm just aware that uh, with the time I want to, I'm going to skip a little bit of this to get on to some of the other stuff. Um, but in, in Grasshopper, what I've done is taken a uh, little bit of code for the, to describe the four-dimensional rotations, but then in Grasshopper, you can turn these into components and as some of you are experiencing these days, 
wire them up and very quickly play with them. Um, and the mix of going back and forth between uh, the normal 3D uh, environment where you can pan and rotate and all that stuff and equations and also plugging stuff together in a way that you can just link one thing and in this case starting with one point transforming it giving it a list of points transforming those or using those lists to make surfaces um, it all becomes very quick and fun and easy to play with so you can turn it into a surface you can get your mobius band with a circular edge and uh, well in this case the klein bottle but if we show the parametrization of it here. Um, so it's got four holes, so it's, you don't see that it's closed, but this is, um, this is Lawson's Klein bottle, the minimal surface in the three sphere, with some holes cut out to reveal uh, the areas where it self intersects. So these are uh, three examples of uh, different topological surfaces, all as minimal surfaces in the three sphere. Um, another, another type of spanning surfaces on knots and links that I had fun playing with is uh, if you've got a torus knot um, where you can sweep that torus knot by taking a four dimensional rotation, um, stereographically projected and varying the two rates of rotation. Um, and that can give you a curve. And if you then make a spanning surface so you can relax the surface on that curve, you can then do the same four dimensional rotation to that surface. And the points along the boundary will follow the original curves. Uh, and that way you can get these surfaces which sweep through space uh, these what I understand they're called open book vibrations. Um, but uh, the last, the last uh, area of this that I want to talk about is something that I'm quite excited about at the moment. Um, so that's that previous one showed a uh, technique you can use when they are torus knots. But if you want to do the same kind of spanning surfaces and get C foot surfaces and vibrations for arbitrary knots, I came across this gray paper. Um, from some physicists about uh, solid angle. And this is, so the solid angle, um, we can visualize it as we take a sphere around a point, move that point around a curve, and then we can check how much of the area of that sphere is cut out when we extrude the curve to the point. Uh, and it's a signed area, so you notice that it uh, switches color as it passes the outside of the boundary. But it, we can, so we can evaluate that function for every point in space, and then we can get a field. So in this case, this is the color is showing the value of that solid angle field as we move a plane uh, through that through that knot. Um, or we can rotate it and can see that uh, it as it wraps around, it's periodic. So we um, choosing a coloring so you don't see that jump. But then you can take a level set of that surface and then that can give you another spanning surface on, on your knot. Uh, so in this case, a C foot surface on a trefoil knot. Um, but you can do it on an arbitrary curve, so you don't have that limitation as before of uh, needing trefoil knots. So I've been having a lot of fun playing with these ideas. Uh, I think Actually, it was Henry Segman who, when I was uh, starting to discuss some of these ideas, he suggested to, to look at the, the figure eight knot as a nice example of, uh, of a vibration that could be, could be interesting to see. Um, also tried it with Borromean rings. Um, here in this case, seeing one page of the open book turning around. But we can also, if we take uh, two opposite pages, we can uh, get a, a surface which passes through the, the curves of the links and get something like this. Uh, so I was looking up what other knots are fibered. In this case, 
pair of trefoils, and yes, it seems seems to work to generate fibrosis from that. Um, or in this case, uh, two components, so taking a whitehead link, showing two fibers of that. Um, one thing that found was quite uh, surprising and confused me at first when I first did this was the geometry is, has two rotational symmetries, but the surface doesn't. Um, but of course, it, uh, when you evaluate the solid angle, which, which way around you're going matters. So the orientation of those curves makes a difference in the surface you get. Um, another suggestion. So I uh, post a lot of this stuff. Um, static. Um, online and uh, had some really enjoyable engagements with all sorts of physicists and mathematicians. And uh, so someone suggested, um, well, if you weight the components, so actually one ring, the solid angle is doubled and some to just a single solid angle of the other. And that gives something very close to the, uh, the Mobius band with a circular edge that I talked about before. So uh, this was uh, Ian Agol, um, mentioned that uh, you can do this for the Borromean ring. So here, weighting one of the curves is, so the blue one has, uh, is multiplied by three, the solid angle for the red one by two, and the green one, just one. Um, and you still get these, uh, these nice surfaces which don't intersect. Um, not, not all knots work for this. So um, if you take a non-fiber knot, then you get uh, singularities as you start turning out. Um, now I'm, I'm uh, sort of exploring far beyond the, the depth of my my true mathematical knowledge, but I, hopefully um, doesn't seem completely ridiculous to, to to play with these things in a geometrical way, and it's something that I like to do to try and get a better understanding of these things. Um, but from the, learning about different fiber knots, I found this, this wonderful paper which shows uh, a sequence. So you can add in extra, you can add the same band, the, the repetitions of the same band and get uh, the figure eight knot, the Borromean rings, and an infinite family of these, these fiber knots. So I took the, the one after the Borromean rings and tried relaxing that. So using the same uh, repulsive knot relaxation I talked about before. And uh, a bit of pushing around, it finds its way to something fairly symmetrical. Um, and we can take that and uh, find. Oh, okay, we can't play that. But I'll, um, I'll put the video up somewhere else later. That's, so it was a rotation of the same um, the solid angle surface on that link. Um, I'm getting close to time, so I'm actually going to, to start wrapping up now. Um, so it's been hopefully uh, ties together in some way, but um, some of the key points I really want to try and get across from as a, as a non-mathematician in my experience of this is like, it's really easy now. To, like you, you look at some of those examples I talked about, of, like George Francis talking about how they made these visualizations or the in the paper about the cross surface and they had they really went to a lot of work to make these visualizations but they they still found it worth it even though taking days and um you know very laborious now you can do the same thing in seconds in free and cheap tools anyone can do it and interact with it real time so uh encourage people to to try it and i know that's exactly why you're here so so I think that's good. Um, I think that illustration will roll, it can do it and make connections uh, between different domains and uh, with those from other disciplines. A lot of the stuff, a lot of the mathematical ideas I've ended up engaging with, I never would have started learning about them if I hadn't seen some of these examples of visualization that I mentioned. Um, I believe that they can be more than just a tool for communication. I think that's the first key is that uh, illustrating can actually be a way of thinking and making illustrations can, it puts it into a different uh, 
you can use your physical intuition, you can um, think of things as physical objects in a way that is much harder to before you visualize them. And finally, um, just to conclude, these are all reasons I try and justify it, but ultimately it's just fun. It's just beautiful and there's, there's so many things to discover and you play and you keep finding new things and um, so keep playing. Uh, I'll wrap up there. Let's, let's all thank Daniel. It's really a, amazing. We, we've got our show and ask in 15 minutes, but um, but it, I think probably lots of you have lots of questions for Daniel. So let's let's take a couple minutes to see if there are any questions. Anyone, you could either just turn your mic on or put it in the chat. Hi. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if um, any of the software you showed us, it would be possible to like generate a data set based on the figures you're looking at. Like maybe I just like care about, I don't know, the angles of some curves, like just just some variables. Like, is there a way to keep track of that? Um, so I, I, I'm not sure I caught the whole question. So in, uh, in Kangaroo, the, the tool in Grasshopper, and you can you can set as many or as few goals as you like. So you can you can take a square and say these two edges are parallel and no other goals. So yeah, you can. The idea is that you can mix and match and add and select. Um, is that does that answer the question? Uh, kind of, I'm like thinking about like, say I had a bunch of different variations on knots and I wanted to like generate a data set. Um, like, and if I, I was playing with it visually and like, as I went, like, can I maybe like mark things to like, like figures that I want, uh, information about, I'm not, maybe this doesn't quite make sense what I'm thinking of. Um, I'm just, I guess like the question is about like generating a data set like if I can I can have like my visual like a set of figures and then is there like an automated way that you know of that I could kind of track information yeah um so the I mean not necessarily so there's like, like a whole ecosystem of tools within Rhino and Grasshopper and the relaxation is one part of it that I developed that you can you can write scripts and link with other things so you can yeah, there are many ways you could be data. You can have data coming in from Excel and going out to Revit. Or, you know, you can you can link all the different softwares. Um, there, are, there are tools for that. Uh, oh, Wesley has his hand up next. Uh, so, um, I have a kind of different and more general and maybe less well posed um, question. Right, so you, you spoke about um, nowadays, right? We have a lot of tools, we have a lot of, of opportunities for producing these nice, helpful visualizations that, you know, many years ago were impossible or maybe were very difficult. Um, and so maybe my question is more kind of looking forward. Are there maybe emerging technologies, emerging tools, emerging ideas that you see as maybe having the potential for really, you know, I don't know, pushing things forward or being that next kind of big step, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I think um, I, virtual reality is, is obviously one of the things that comes to mind is having a, a resurgence and uh, it, geometry visualization was you know, a lot of the very early pioneers were actually, you know, some of the earliest uses of, of VR were in geometry departments. And, um, but interactivity is another one I think is very exciting. I think now um, it's, it's also very easy to make a, make something and put it on the web in the way that people, you know, anyone can click a link and on their phone can start seeing what happens if you change this parameter and see how the surface turns just on their phone or their computer. Um, I mean, I think 
generally geometry Geometry processing, ways of generating geometry is still a very active field. There's still many unanswered questions. Um, I think around meshing, um, level set surfaces and slight distance fields, I think are very, very lots of exciting developments going on there too. Great. Okay, we, Thanks. We're really limited on time, but uh, I know Aaron, Saul, and Elliot had their hands up. So let's let's get to you. I think we're just have time for those three, and then we'll have to have to call it a day. Aaron, yeah, hi, thanks a lot, Daniel, for a beautiful presentation. Um, speaking of interactivity, which you just mentioned, I just was wondering, you know, you showed some amazing animations and some things that that um, you know, playing with soap films and and seafood surfaces and changing the knot and things like that. I wonder if any of those tools uh, are available for people to play with and interact with. Do those exist online somehow? Yeah. Um, so what I show is mainly happening in Rhino, um, which runs locally. There are ways, I mean, you can actually access Rhino running on a server. So I, uh, I can share a link, like I've sometimes put uh, you can, you can have a web page which links to a grasshopper definition, which is running on a computer somewhere else. Um, but um, I mean, the, I think there are there are also many dedicated online platforms which are also um, make that even easier um, and faster. Um, I just I'm I'm always working in Rhino and Grasshopper because of the other, I mean, for the other applications in my my day job about you know designing stuff for architecture so I, I tend to stay mainly mostly in this platform but I think there are there are certainly technologies which can make these things easier to access and interact with. Daniel the the soap film surfaces that you that you showed that were uh, that could were capable of changing topology was that your mesh machine component? Uh, so it's a it's a development of that. It's from the same line of development, I've, I've now got a few tools. Um, there is there is a remesher, so like a feature preserving remesher in Rhino now, which is something I've developed. Um, and there's like if you want to get good triangulation for doing analysis on, it can be useful. There's also as part of Kangaroo, there's what I call the live soap component, which does it's a soap film which can adaptively change its topology. Um, which was quite challenging in terms of getting because uh, keeping track of the indexing of the particles and when you're, when you're changing it dynamically was took a lot of that. But so, um, I just wanted to start by saying thank you very much. That was a really beautiful talk. Uh, I also wanted to ask a question or perhaps um, make a suggestion. Uh, have you thought at all about the Sphere version problem? I would, I would very much like to tackle that, definitely. Um, yeah, and I think there's, I know uh, uh, George Francis as well was, oh, yeah, something I'd like to, to look at more. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk more. And I actually just generally um, to everyone, like um, if you have ideas of things which you think would be interesting to visualize, I'm very much open to suggestions or, uh, I, I, I maybe if I could follow up, may, could I ask, will you be having an office hours where we could uh, mob you? Yeah, sure. I'll be I'll be uh, online for the rest of the uh, rest of the, the event. So uh, I mean, maybe not. It's uh, with UK time zones, probably in the, the earlier part of the day for you, I'll be more likely to be around. But uh, yeah, thank you again. Elliot. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the talk. So I was wondering, um, all of the energy functionals you talked about in this were physically inspired, like they were simulating, I don't know, like a bubble film or something like that. I was wondering if you tried any like more esoteric or abstract energy functionals and if you got in any that gave like particularly cool results. Yeah, um, there are many. Um, so, um, so it started out with physically based ones, but uh, what actually, so uh, the equality goals, which is not, 
I can't think of any real physical analogy, but um, taking a pair of, of angles and saying those angles have to stay equal, but then doing that to all of the angles of all the triangles on a mesh or something. So there's, um, yeah, there's a whole load now of, of non-physical non energies in there. Um, uh, yeah, um, happy to talk more, I'll give more examples. Um, but yeah, there's a there's a lot. It started out as you know digital version of physical form finding, and it uh, eventually morphed into something much broader about general geometric uh, energies. And not come open for those. I have. I just remember I saw something at some point where they gave an energy that optimized so that things ended up having like like right angles and like gave this nice like cubic structure to things. Yeah, yeah. So I was yeah, wondering if there's stuff like that that you came across. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know the paper you mean. Uh, actually, that's, that's an, I heard that uh, that was uh, it wasn't what they were originally trying to do. It was a different different optimization that went wrong, but they liked the result of the wrong version that they turned it into a paper. Um, but yeah, there's um, like there's there's an, a very interesting one that uh, developability energy, um, which takes a mesh and tries to make it piecewise developable based on uh, some work by um, Keenan Crane and others. Um, and that's, it's completely non-physical and no material behaves like that. But yeah, and from optimizing for certain geometric constraints, you can get all sorts of surprising, interesting forms. Okay, thank you. Well, let's all thank Daniel one more time. I was really excited by your talk to Daniel, so. Just a reminder.